Sorry about that. A little little business today, coming in and out. All right, so uh, where was I? Um, I believe we were discussing. Oh yeah, America's like uh, getting you know basically t taking the shit and um, being in the shit and sacrificing blood and treasure and every other thing, and uh, we've got our own. Uh, it's time to rebuild America. It's time to, um, you know, it's like we've, uh, with 30 years of war, people don't realize war is expensive. It costs a lot. It costs a lot in blood. It costs a lot in treasure. It costs a lot in men, material. People get sick of it. They really do. They get sick of it. So when it comes down to, like, the next, next ass kicking that would have to be <laughs> meted out, it's it's going to be because like uh, some fools tried to get us involved in yet another foreign war, and I do not think Americans. I know for certain I won't be going down that road, and I'm pretty fairly certain that the rest of uh, fighting age males in America are not going to go down that road either. So that would be um, suicidal. It's like they say when all else fails, they take you to war. That's a lack of creativity. Um. And that's probably like uh, in part three that I talked about in the earlier outline, Fortress America, the Fortress America plan. It's like, yeah, everybody will petition for American um, aid, but it's like, what are we going to get involved at a, in an eight front war in uh, Ethiopia? Are we going to get involved in Myanmar? See, we hate human rights abuses. I cannot friggin' stand human rights abuses. Uh, genocide but I mean look at what the UK and Europe has done and what some governors in the United States have done and it's like even when I go over to like um, tell you a little story um, I went into um, a little grocery store and I'll name it Sprouts it's a little shit little overpriced fucking kitschy sort of um, you know, vegetarian, blah, blah, blah. Everything's natural here, even though it's not overpriced. But I needed a tofurkey because I wanted one for Easter. And uh, I went over there to see if they had one. Walked in. You know, I'll walk in right past everybody because I'm just going to do that. And I walked up to the lady. I said, do you have a tofurkey? And she said, well, you, you need to wear a mask. And I didn't even acknowledge that she had said anything to me. Do you have a tofurkey? Um, and then they thought about it. They ruminated on it and just said, "No, we don't." Said, well, that was all. That's that's it. That's all I wanted. So I left. I went across to that um, um, Total Wine, you know, where they sell the booze or whatever. And look, this is not a state. Uh, it's not a law. It's not a state mandate. Uh, it's not. Um, it's not even a county. <laughs> ordinance it's nothing it's literally nothing but their policies uh, a business which is in my opinion discriminatory but we'll get onto that later i mean i'll make a point about that in just a moment after i finish my story well i'll go into total wine because i was going to get a case of beer and um i just ignored everybody of course and did that you know, where you hold your spirit in so you're not observed so you just pass by unobserved well, I saw that lady that had given me hell before when I, there, when I called her a dog. Well, I came by her. I, I, I said, you know what? I'm going to walk right by her and see what happens. I walked right by her with a case of beer, and she turned, she turned to me, and she said, uh, you have to wear a mask if you want to purchase anything here. So I just continued to walk, and I just dropped the case and walk out because I'm not going to argue with these people. Um personally if you don't sell to somebody that has money um that's discrimination you know maybe if it's not the mask and she should have been wearing two uh that fucking hypocrite because well <laughs> she just should have been wearing two maybe three because that's what the cdc tells you but I mean, what do you have to do to show uh, to not be uh, molested, accosted, 
challenged. I mean, perhaps we should all be wearing a swastika on our arm instead of uh, masks, because that would just show party solidarity, and then we wouldn't be questioned. And if you uh, if you opposed it or you didn't agree with it, you would need a gold star to appease these fucking Nazis. So. That's just my opinion on it. The mask is medically, uh, you know, any, anybody that has a fucking brain knows that it, it's not, it's not, I mean, it's the friggin' common cold, number one, and number two, like, you would only wear it if you were sick. It's not for healthy people, all right? Or if you were particularly worried about it, that would be your choice. But for somebody to tell me that I have to do it when my money's good... Seems like discrimination. So perhaps we should all get our uh, Nazi armband swastikas just to be certain we can all show party solidarity so we can fucking buy goods before we're excluded from being able to make purchases unless we abide by their stupid, foolish mandates. Now I'll take my business elsewhere. And I won't necessarily argue, but definitely know that I stand in opposition to because that's the next step. If you can get people to do shit like that, well, the next step is the fucking party solidarity bullshit. Then after that comes the death ditches. Anybody that disagrees or speaks up, they put you in a fucking trench. Or, you know, if they really don't need you, they put you on the train and they fucking smoke your ass. And that's a chapter in history that we do not need to repeat, especially not in America, because we will hand your ass to you. And that's what I say, like, the, this fomentation of a potential conflict based on ideologies or a conflict in ideologies would remove America from the table when it came to any sort of intervention in the Ukraine or Germany or Europe or wherever else. If it needed... if they wanted to make sure, make deadly certain that America was taken out of the game. Now we've got our our financial um, system, which could be you know pull the trigger on that any any time because that's uh, all based on a, a house of cards. But we've known that for a hundred years. What people don't fully understand when the Federal Reserve was created. or before the Federal Reserve, we had a boom bust cycle of about every eight years. We also had trouble um, after the Civil War. We had uh, the greenbacks, and we had um, some people would argue for like the gold and silver. Some people didn't want to add silver to it. Some people just wanted the gold standard. Then we got then there were some loans from the of course London friggin' bankers. That was something like twenty five percent, and. Um, and that was, you know, post-Reconstruction. So it's like America had its own currency, greenbacks. That's may well, that's super conspiracy theory to say that um, people can be possessed um, or spiritually motivated, perhaps, to commit an assassination. I don't know. That's pretty pretty far out there. I mean, Booth. That probably was just um, an unfortunate turn of events. For I mean, even speaking as a Southerner, you know, it's for Lincoln to have been shot like that, to have been assassinated like that. Just you know, we had the the South, you know, had surrendered. The armies of Northern Virginia were not defeated. They had to go all the way around, all the way to, to the Mississippi, and then back up through Atlanta because they couldn't outmaneuver Lee. You know, many people would argue he's probably one of the greatest military minds in in history with all the fancy footwork. You know, at least on par with Napoleon. Some would argue. I'd like to argue that point with one particular fan of Napoleon, but anyway, political assassination, and I'll even speak to this a little bit later too, because um, 
uh, had a little issue with the um, with somebody that was discussing militia stuff the other day, and my comments were deleted, which I did not care very much for at all. Because I mean, you're you're claiming to be um, uh, an American militia like a supporter of the American militia, attached to the American militia, appreciative of the importance, the vital importance of, of the Second Amendment and having a militia to make sure that you don't have a tyranny of government because everyone knows that the people that tend to gravitate towards power uh, have a tendency to be assholes, jerk-offs. They take too much. They go too far. And the whole point of having a militia is to ensure a free society, to make sure that you were on par with anybody that could be tyrannical, you know, signing hidden orders, giving edicts, doing uh, dictatorial, unconstitutional things, you know. So we don't live in a world where might makes right. I mean, those who desire peace must prepare for war. So we have a second amendment for a reason. So we have a peaceful and polite society. We haven't forgotten that. But to betray the um, first amendment, when I had a few criticisms there, well, I suppose I'll get my, uh, I'll, 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 I'll retaliate in some way, have something to say. Because that's a, that's a betrayal I can't stand. To speak on principle and then do some fucked up shit like that. I digress, but I'll tell you what's on my mind. All right. Nothing new under the sun. Historical perspective. Now, I could read you a little bit of a historical perspective because I think I just alluded to the tricks of the banksters and the gold standard and the silver standard and the boom bust cycle and what the Federal Reserve was to, designed to do. It was designed to smooth out that boom bust cycle. And it didn't really get uh, choppy until the 70s when Nixon took us off the gold window because Charles de Gaulle of France wanted to repatriate the bullion that we had stashed over here during uh, World War II because nobody wanted to have their loot taken from them. So they sent it to America to be held for them while they had it out because a big prize would be the bullion. So if you couldn't vault it like the um, Swiss, then, you know, because of the geography, that particular um, part of the world, they, you know, sent it to America for safekeeping. And de Gaulle wanted it back. Well, at that point in time, they still needed to secure Asia. Okay, they, had, they were establishing relationships with China. That would be uh, Kissinger's plan. They probably wanted some level of encirclement to make sure that China didn't betray him. We had already gone to Korea, so we had secured South Korea, which now has a large Christian population, as well as a very productive economy, um, uh, principles that are based on uh, freedom. Um, like, I've known um, several South Koreans that have come to America. One married a, one of my best friends because my, be my best friend um, became a school teacher at what they call a hogwan in South Korea. Um, he didn't like their strict work ethics so much because uh, he was, you know, an English teacher, but he was teaching like fourth grade English to South Koreans. So it's not really, uh, you know, like super challenging in that way. But... Um, like he wanted to go out drinking one night and uh, just call in sick the next day. Some shit that an American would do, right? It's like, fuck it. I don't feel like going to work. <laughs> okay. I don't want to go today. Fuck it. I'm, yeah, I'm calling in sick. Well, they send the, the school sends over two people to his apartment, wherever he was staying and knocked on the door and, oh, Hey, are you all right? Are you sick? And checking on him. Seeing if he was, you know, cutting class, so to speak, skipping work. And so he didn't like that particular um, aspect of the South Korean work ethic. An American kind of likes to have his uh, mental health days, so to speak. 
but um, in Korea, no, that shit doesn't fly. You better be, you better be sick, or you better be at work. And if you're sick, then they'll come over and look after you. They'll honestly, you know, take care of their own people. Um, it's good business. You know, they take care of their people. Um, you know, they've got all kinds of, of neat stuff. Um, you know, like indoor golf ranges and things to help the South Koreans de-stress because they work very hard. So they create good work environments. So I've heard. So I've heard. But it kind of chafes against an American sometimes. And, uh... Well, anyway, he married a South Korean woman and came back here to the States. And, of course, my grandmaster was um, Korean. So, whether or not he may have been a North Korean that made it to South Korea, I don't know, or born a South Korean, I'm not sure. But he did end up teaching the um, South Korean Air Force in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So, there's that. Anyway, and then Japan. Let, well, let's just let's just go through Asia a little bit because we're talk we're we're putting a little bit of a historical example on it because it plays to the larger part, especially when we're going to look at the uh, Russia China relationship, Chinese relationship. So we have to have a little historical context, and we're still in the 1970s era. So we've, we're opening up relationships with China because I believe it was the American idea that if we started doing business with the Chinese, that they would become a more free and open society because they would have, you know, shared, you know, some of our cultural values. It doesn't appear that it worked out that way because, but for, I hear two different perspectives. Um, one is somebody that's observing the Chinese in China and their economic miracles so they don't really complain because they're happy even though the government is communist they're happy because they're prosperous so I mean Chinese dissidents do get drug off and murdered I think I mean I think I've presented um, evidence to at least support that in AGR mandate of heaven and of they're rough to the Uyghurs, and um, they play rough in on the border of India and Pakistan. And China's got sort of a loose alliance with Pakistan, but I would say that's very loose. The Indians and the Chinese do not get along. The Indians and the Pakistanis do not get along. And perhaps more uh, of a word later on Pakistan. Um, we'll circle. Uh, Saki's got it in my fucking head now. We'll circle back to that. But I'll actually circle back to it. I'm not going to deflect unless I forget. But if you're in the live chat, remind me. <laughs> we'll circle back. <laughs> so, South Korea and then Vietnam was being secured because the French had pulled out. So we were going to secure Vietnam. And now to this day, we have a good relationship with Vietnam. Japan, of course, that was World War II, and we share a good relationship with Japan. And see, the Japanese do not get along with the Chinese. They don't. And they do not particularly get along with the Russians. Like, they've had their... spats, so to speak, because the Japanese, when it comes to war, they do not fuck around. Um, in a, a, pretty much warfare in um, among Asians is not really a, unless you're one of them it's not a matter of honor like it is for a westerner like I guess because you know we've had such a long history of conflict in Europe and that's where most of our roots come from is um, in European conflicts we kind of have this at least we have a code we feel as if we have a code of honor they say there are no rules in war and i tell you that's bullshit you know we don't use chemical weapons we don't use um it's like you know when you saw every we saw everybody get all screwed up after world war one 
World War II did have some rules. It's like... Some shit is just a nasty way to die and to be stuck in a trench breathing uh, chlorine gas. Well, I think you might rather get machine gun, but none of it, no, no part of war is good. But we do um, have a code um, of honor. They kind of um, diminished our... Um, they foolishly diminished what I believe was our moral authority when they authorized things like a state-sanctioned torture. So if they did away with shit like that, it would be um, healthier for the American spirit. But that's um, I'm not going to say it's neither here nor there. It's a it's a bugging my ass but and I don't think I'll let that one go either torture is not acceptable um all right so at that time you know we had Vietnam Korea South Korea, or South Korea Vietnam Japan um an opening business with China at that time we had um, a very cool relationship with the Soviet Union. It was, well, the Cold War, after all. And when I say that the CIA, you know, we're not, we didn't all blow, get blown up in a nuclear holocaust in the 60s. Well, and then you look at um, the collapse of the Soviet Union, you would think that probably some change agents working with the uh, old, um, like, the Russian Orthodox arm of the KGB that became the FSB, the Christian sector of the Soviet Union. Because the Soviets, the, all those communists, they didn't have any religious ideology. They'd, they'd fucking kill, Stalin would kill you over that crap because he didn't want to be opposed. But I suppose Putin would know more about it than I do. But I suspect, you know, it's when when Russia was having the Great Famine, or the Soviet Union was having a Great Famine, Hoover sent uh, tons of, of grain, literally tons of grain, to make sure that the people in the Soviet Union were fed. They weren't going to starve to death. We fought together against the Nazis, and the Russians did most of the heavy lifting against the Nazis. That's just a fact. So we haven't forgotten our roots. Um, you know, it's like Russia and America sometimes, well, I guess, pretend to be enemies, but we're really not. Um, during our Revolutionary War, the Russians sent naval power to, well, it, and also the French helped us quite a bit um, to keep, well, the British naval power at bay because we had a fledgling navy at that point um so we got a great deal of assistance from the french and a little assistance from the russians during the civil war we had more assistance from the russians um that kept european powers from interfering in our internal civil war so it was a uh, russian navy that was actually keeping european powers from taking advantage of our civil war, our situation, keeping it isolated. So, despite all, all the bullcrap we hear, um, you know, Uncle Sam and Mother Russia shared more history, um, and a lot of that history that we share is having resources and getting fucked by Europe, pretty much. So, I mean, that's nothing new to us. <laughs> getting fucked by Europe and having um, resources. So I think my opinion on Russia is pretty clear. Um, as far as um, China's relationship with Russia goes, it's very cool. Um, 
there's only really one point where the Chinese could expand into Russia. They wouldn't challenge Russia. Russia and China held um, joint exercises. And while I do not support a communist government, because they say, you know, this is because I'm a man of the republic, a man of the people. I love America. I love Western values. And I will not betray them. I will not betray our history. I will not betray our principles. So I would... I don't look favorably upon a uh, dictatorial or communist uh, country at all. I would prefer to see them adopt Western values, but far be it from me to ram it down their throats at the barrel of a gun. Um, if the Chinese want change, they'll do it like the Chinese have always done it, and with an internal civil war. I mean, that's one thing that Chinese can really do well because they, with their billion population, they end up with these military geniuses that come out of nowhere and they can really get things done. I mean, people like to think that there's this digital panopticon or whatever and that it catches everything and sees all. And, and I, I got to tell you, it's bullshit. It's like we hear so much bullshit. Like, if I wasn't sitting right here, right now, in this particular platform by my choice I mean you would have some records on me but you wouldn't have any um, you wouldn't have any indication of what my inner thoughts might be I share with you because I believe we're in a period of time where it's important to share important to sort this out important to figure it out so we know where we stand and we know who we are so we know where we're going like, sometimes I give up a lecture where it seems like I pontificate a little bit. It's just my nature. If that offends you, you can go fuck yourself. I'm sure I can maybe find something else that would offend you more, hopefully. I struggle with it, though. <laughs> I struggle with it. All right. So that was, you know, the 70s. That's when we went off the gold center because we had to fund these operations and we couldn't fund them with gold. We needed encirclement. We got it. So we knew it had a shelf life. We knew it had a lifespan. Volcker um, brought it back to life with some high interest rates, but they thought that basically the American government had defaulted when they went off the gold standard. But they held it together. And they still want to hold it together. They love that that um, infinite you know, amount of money sort of idea. But it never lasts. A fiat, a fiat is always implemented to basically achieve a short-term goal. And then you go back to some sort of sound money practice. But it's important to watch this sound money practice and the things that people are proposing, whether it be Bitcoin, which I don't like and don't believe in because it's just another f system of control. So they can, they can set a camera up and instead of you just, you know, instead of, you know, you being able to maybe like speed a little bit and there's nobody on the road you want to have some fun you want to go up 60 70 120 miles an hour whatever that's you having fun but they set a camera up on the road and then just deduct it from your account what's next jaywalking or maybe they just cut you off because you didn't get the fucking vaccine so i'm a man that likes to hold cash i'm poor so it's not really that big of an issue but i'll get on to a little bit about this later i'm going to talk about the greatest depression and how to how that how the people in 36 managed it successfully managed it and I've already put together playlists and things like this for you to look at okay so political corruption of course that's nothing new and um, I, I would entertain that you would think carefully about a gold silver standard and what that would mean um, and who's holding and who's not. 
I would also like to point out that um, in the art of war, sometimes it's necessary to conceal your intentions, especially when you want to see how things unfold. Being the last, there's always, like even in a poker game, there's always an advantage to being the last to act and having a big stack. So when you look at the Biden-Harris administration, and it leaves Europe wondering, hell, it leaves Americans wondering, do I call Biden? Do I call Kamala Harris? Do I call Blinken? Who the fuck do I call? Well, you don't know who to call. Sorry. So that gives, well, I suppose, a little more time to analyze what your intent would be because you don't even know who's running the show. And while this is not really uh, spiritually healthy, ultimately for Americans, because Americans like to be certain of their leadership, it does play to a larger, it could play well to a larger geopolitical sort of um, game, so to speak, because it conceals American intention and gives opportunity to analyze a situation and create a uh, a place where you can be unpredictable. Now, personally, I like to play the cards face up, on the table, by the rules, so we all know exactly where we stand. Um, you know, I'll cut a good line of bullshit just as much as the next guy, but when I'm bullshitting you, you probably know it. And when I'm not bullshitting you, you probably know that too. Because who am I? I'm just a nobody. I'm just another conspiracy theorist with a, an opinion. Okay. So, let's move on here. Syria, like uh, I, I believe I spoke just a little bit about, you know, we saw Russian intervention in Syria. Of course we would. To stabilize Syria or to ensure that the pipeline didn't go through Syria, or to create stability in Syria while the northern pipelines go through, or they may still need Syria for something. The Syrians have called Americans that are still operating in Syria something like pirates because, you know, there are still some Americans there that are controlling those oil fields and taking some loot. You know, Afghanistan taking some loot. Well, yeah, if when you when you're like um, kind of like the Romans, in a sense, um, you know, you can't finance it all on the back of Americans. You got to finance it with oil, and you got to finance it with drugs. Worse costs money, so part of that is getting the loot. I mean, I hate to break it to you, but that's just a cold, cold, hard fact of reality. And the more real we can be about it, the more um, if we if we don't bullshit ourselves too much, we can actually figure out what we're going to do, how to do it. What's the best way forward? We just got to cut the shit. All right. Like in my heart. Um, I kind of look at Americans as part of my extended family. All right, they're my countrymen. So, if you're an American, I'm not saying you get a pass on things that you've done wrong. I'm saying you would fall under our principles and laws. But a soldier follows orders. That's what a soldier does.
Now that just following order shit. I've known many American military men. And I've even known uh, American military men that were about to receive pensions here recently that um, weren't going to go along with some mask bullshit and they quit. They, and much to the chagrin of their wife because, uh, you know, he was standing on principle. I don't give a fuck. They can take the money and they can stick it up their fucking ass. Like, I'm not doing it. Because, and then she was like, well, what are we going to do about our family? You know, we're going to do about money. Well, I'll figure it out. I'll fucking figure it out. But there are just some things I ain't going to do. Like, I'll suffer. And we'll all suffer. We'll suffer as a family. I'm sorry. That's the way it's got to be. But I stand on principle. And um, women don't necessarily always like to hear that. But a man has to have a code. And I've known a lot of uh, American military men and others that have served, come back, a lot of my friends, because I did, I was in high school in 9-11, during 9-11. Remember, uh, I was uh, in 10th grade, or the morning that uh, it happened. And uh, me kind of being the sick son of a bitch that I was at the time, I looked at it when those towers came down, I said, I'm impressed. And the whole freaking class turned around and looked at me like they were going to fucking murder me. But I had just stated that I was. I look back um, at how... I look back at my own lack of humanity and my own lack of compassion... as a pitiful chapter in my history where I had not come to know God or Christ or even love for my country as much as I should have but times change people grow So, Americans are my extended family, in my mind. And so when an American is abused, a veteran is abused, an elderly person is abused, to the, to the, to the benefit of of my countrymen is my first, well, not my first concern. My, my first duty is to God. And second would be to my country. You have to love a thing and believe in a thing, believe in the principles for it to be anything so we'll talk a little bit about the fortress america plan this american neutrality so you know we can play it however we want to i mean i've already st i stand opposed to bitcoin because i just look at it as an over glorified western union and frankly people on the street are not going to use it um i don't like to use it because it's fucking complicated uh, i don't like to use it because it's hackable. I mean, so much money has been stolen off the exchanges, and it, and if you can't sell cra cracks of you know vials of crack, you can't. You're not going to buy a crack with Bitcoin. I'm sorry, it's not going to fucking work. If you can't do hand to hands on the street with it, it's just it's not going to work. All right. Now they could always do that fascist shit where they try and shut you out unless you use Bitcoin, but then they'll get major pushback. Prime example, see, Florida's pretty pretty loose with the mask mandates. Very good decision. Because we weren't gonna we weren't gonna listen to that shit anyway. It's clear we got spring break. It's too fucking hot around here. <laughs> Day one we said no. Fuck that. Forget it. 
And and DeSantis is, seems to be fairly politically astute. And um, I'm pleased with the administration of Florida. But in Georgia, you see a little different. They were real hard on people, especially in Atlanta. All right. But I remember watching a video. They came around. There was this black guy that was standing outside. And these two white cops come up to him. And the black guy was just outside by himself. Had lowered his mask to talk on the telephone. Outside, nobody was around. Two, two um, thugs come around the corner. And they say, uh, we're going to write you a ticket because you're not wearing your mask properly. And the guy's like, I just stepped outside to make a phone call. And they're like, sign it. Sign it. $110 fine. And the, and the black guy's just like anybody else. $110 is nothing. It's no fucking small thing. That's big, that's that's your friggin' groceries, man. That might be your rent. That's your that's your ability to maybe get to work. That's that's nothing over and that's no small thing. Especially if you know you're like working you know like uh working a job for like 10, 11, 13 bucks an hour, maybe. You know, so even at 20 bucks an hour, you know, $110 after, it's like, and then that's after taxes and everything else they take out of you. That's a pretty big fine. So he didn't want to sign it. You put your name to it because he doesn't understand it. And I agree with him. I don't understand this. He didn't understand it. He tried to protest, but they were like, if you don't sign it, we're going to, we're going to fucking drag your ass in we're gonna arrest you you're gonna have to put up with all that shit the guy was like man i don't even know what time we're living in here like what time what, what time is this like what, what what days are we living in some motherfuckers can come around the side and basically threaten to haul you away because you're not wearing a piece of clothing properly fucking nuts he knew it i knew it those cops should have known it but they didn't so they say, well, we'll do these COVID cards, and you, well, you get if you show your little COVID card where you got your vaccination, we'll give you a free donut. We'll give you a free donut, cigarettes, uh, pot. So I'll tell you what they did in Atlanta or in Georgia. They went and burned that fucking Krispy Kreme to the ground, like the original Krispy Kreme. They burned that motherfucker to the ground. That's what we think of your fucking free donut, motherfuckers. You can take that free donut and stick it right up your ass. And I don't disagree with them. You know, property destruction, I ain't all about that. I ain't all about riots and violence and shit like that. But when you bring violence against people, what do you expect you're going to get in return? You threaten to take their money. You threaten their livelihoods. You threaten their freedom. What do you expect they're going to do? It's not rocket science. Give them a fucking donut. Unbelievable. It's insulting, is what it is. Oh yeah, we'll pr we'll prioritize vaccines for the um, the elderly and the um, and we'll make sure the black communities are able to get it first. Well, do you ever remember the Tuskegee experiments where they infected uh, black people with syphilis just to see how they would um, how it would affect them? You know fucking rotten but it's been known to be done you know like uh, what about the American Indians so if you think that it's not above these motherfuckers to do that kind of shit and I'm white I find it so fucking morally reprehensible and so disgusting it's because it's a fascist I it's a Nazi ideology and human experimentation is absolutely unacceptable we have uh, what we even have the Geneva Convention that you cannot experiment on human beings and force them to do that shit. Well, they, they, they're trying. Get your free donut. Here's your free donut, motherfuckers. All right. Make my own damn donuts. Take that little COVID card and stick it up your ass. Okay. So... I don't, not all about property destruction, but what do you expect people are going to do, okay? All right. 
Now, I've already spoken about the Asian alliances. I've already spoken a little bit about the Biden-Harris confusion and how that could possibly play to advantage. Uh, talked about the cool relationship between China and Russia. Now, let's talk about Chinese aggression. Who are the Chinese going to aggress against? Honestly. Um, they might look at Taiwan because Taiwan was the old um, capital of China. But I don't think that the Chinese want that level of a headache. I just don't think that they do. Because, see, the Chinese have all this brand new infrastructure. They have this mercantile society. And I just don't think that they want all their brand new shit blown up. And if they go and get too um, aggressive in the Asian sphere... Asians will come back on them big time. Like, that's just one thing about Asians. They have a tendency to hate each other. It's like uh, the conflict between India and China up in the Kashmir region, with Pakistan slightly involved in the loose alliance between Pakistan and China. Like, you're going to mess with the Indians? I think not. And I said I would circle back to the whole Pakistan issue. I spoke to a uh, Pakistani recently, and um, you know, I said, you know, so much opportunity for Pakistan, because I'm thinking Pakistan will flip. I'd like to see Pakistan flip, because um, they've got resources and all kinds of stuff. I'm sure the Australians would do business with them, but the Pakistani says, we can't do, we just can't do it, because the Indians hate us too much. And in that part of the world, what India says goes. It just does. Um, so if the Indians hate the Pakistanis, and they most certainly do, the, the Pakistanis are just like, well, we, fuck, we going to do about it. Like, we're just, we're not in a position to do anything about it. Um, I mean, they're a nuclear armed power, but so is India. So I just don't think that, um, that China is going to want to aggress over, you know, Kashmir. I mean, they've got conflict going on. Definitely got conflict going on in that part of the world. But again, that might be related to drugs because there's, a, I mean, it's pretty big cash crop of hash and marijuana, and that goes into Europe as well. So it's probably about the drug money, probably a little bit about the drug money. Because the world has run on a couple of things. It runs on energy, but it also runs on drugs. Let's not forget that. Stimulants, the Industrial Revolution. It's like, what did the British want from the Chinese when they started to industrialize? They wanted tea. Why? Because they wanted to get that sleepy-ass farmer up to work in the factory. Well, what did they need? They needed tea. What did they want from America? Tobacco. You know, so they go to China and they're losing their ass because they're paying silver for the tea and they want to try and recoup a little bit of that. So their treasuries don't get emptied. So they say, all right, well, well, we'll sell them. We'll sell the Chinese opium because Chinese Chinese don't have I don't think that big a taste for alcohol. They have Asian flush. For the most part, they don't have an enzyme to process alcohol or, ch or cheese or milk. Japanese seem to be able to drink everybody else under the friggin' table. So, but anyway, British were like, we're going to sell you opium so we can get our tea. And Chinese said, no, 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 we can't have that. And that's probably still going on to some degree. So stimulants, right? They run the world. It's to the Industrial Revolution. Then you have the uh, computer um, where industrialization has to go even faster. We're, we're competing now with, um, you know, like advanced systems that require a lot of attention, a lot of time. So what what's the next big thing? Amphetamines. It's like, so there's every, you, you push the human machine as you develop the technologies and basically you're drugging your workforce to get more out of them 
So the world runs on drugs too. And a few other things I'd care not to mention because I find it so fucking disgusting. Okay, we're going to move on to China. We'll still stay on Chinese aggression. So who are they going to aggress against? Japan doesn't really have anything that they want. Japan has more of a need than the Chinese do. The Chinese won't aggress against Russia. They won't aggress against India. That'd be suicide. They don't want to dam up the... Like, they would be crazy to dam up the rivers above, you know... Uh, Thailand and um, Vietnam and like you know like the Chinese might want to exert some power as far as like what, what they think their fishing rights are in the South China Sea but you know pissing off Asians is just not a very smart thing to do it's just not and uh, with all the nice new infrastructure that China has they might posture I believe they posture a little bit uh, they probably don't. They, they probably are taking a defensive posture with the Russians to make sure, you know, that um, because, quite frankly, nobody trusts DC. They just don't trust them, and I don't blame them. I do not blame them because they start wars because they don't give a shit about people. They don't give a shit about anything but the money, and that makes them dangerous. So. I kind of look at what some of the Chinese, uh, what some of the things that the Chinese are doing, at least militarily, is to kind of be um, sort of a defensive thing. But, you know, because I just don't see where any sort, like the Chinese uh, do a little bit better with um, expanding their culture. Like, doing, uh, like moving in enough Chinese and then they um, have a... Um, uh, they, they grow their communities, and then once there's enough Chinese people there, well, it's China now. So because the culture, they up, they do um, conquest by culture. Um, and Japan, I see in the future, I see Japan and America having a great relationship. I look forward to uh, a relationship with Japan because they're a very clever, hardworking people. Um, with great ideas that are have always been kind of pressed and strained for resources. So if um, China continues to steal intellectual property and they don't want to, you know, they don't want to play nice, um, then we'll just do, we, we'll do business with someone else. We'll do business with Vietnam. We'll do business with South Korea. We'll do business with Japan. We'll supply them with the raw materials that they need. So, you know, now that's up to China. That's up to China. Like, um, you know, they get, in my opinion, the Chinese get used just as much as, uh, the, have been used in history just as much as, um, we Americans and the Russians, the Chinese, I mean, we've all, as big uh, nations with lots of resources, we've been used time and time again. And um, none of us like to be cheated. So, um, when it comes to China, yes, we do have some definite ideological disagreements. But as long as China don't tell me how to run my fucking life, then I'm not going to tell them how to run their fucking life. And if they don't like it, you know, if the Chinese people don't like it, well, I suppose the Chinese people will do something about it. It's not um, my responsibility to inflict Western values where they're not wanted. I can't see where anybody wouldn't enjoy freedom, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. But, you know, you think about China and how many borders they share with other nations and other cultures. Perhaps they don't want cross-cultural contamination. Because, uh, like we see on our own southern border, you can be hit with an influx of immigrants that will change your culture and dilute your culture. And... Uh, and 
like we've seen in Europe with the major influx um, of, of Muslims that were moving into Europe. It changed their culture. You know, whereas Sweden was one time one of the most peaceful places on earth, now you've got no-go zones and um, gangs of Muslim men raping Swedish women. So there's your fucking uh, cultural melting pot. It's a, it's um. Everybody kind of needs to um, have time to culturally acclimate. Like I'm getting new neighbors from other places, and I take the time to culturally acclimate them because uh, we have a certain standard that we have here, and I stand up for it. So. It's about saying things like Happy Easter. It's about waving to one another. It's about being slow around school buses. It's about, you know, really taking your time to smell the roses. We're not in any rush here. Slow the fuck down. Look out for other people. Don't honk at anybody. Don't get all shitty. Just if you ain't got something nice to say, don't say anything at all. Don't start no shit. Won't be no shit. And everybody's pretty cool. And that's just the way it's got to be. And you, you definitely have to have respect for your elders. That's a big thing. It's a big, huge thing. We look after our children and we look after our elderly. And we also do things like pick up the trash. Like we don't just throw trash on the ground and kind of be like, oh, well, you know, it's uh, somebody's, uh, it's the maintenance guy's job at the apartment complex to pick it up. Now you see some trash, you fucking pick it up. Like Sunday night, I, I was out there, I saw some, um, thorns in the bushes I put my glove on I pulled the thorny pulled the thorns out of the bushes so like I got bushes that nobody else has got they haven't had to tear them up because I'll go out there and I'll pull the weeds throw them in the dumpster because I like to have a nice sidewalk and my neighbors do too sweep it off and things nice we all live here and that's part of our culture so when you come here and uh, you just get, you're going to get acclimated to it, or uh, you uh, could be like my other neighbor and you'll get my death stare. <laughs> and you'll move the fuck up the block. <laughs> but even he's coming around now because it just, he, all, he wanted to get all up in my face because I'm dressed differently. I'm not, maybe I got long hair. Do, maybe I'm a maybe I'm a hippie. Maybe I'm a one of these crazy fucking um, commie liberals or some shit. Well, I got news for you, motherfucker. I look different, but I'm just as red blooded American as you could find. It's serious as a heart attack. So I don't give a shit if you're uh, you, you know you got this uh, fat belly military bearing uh, shaved head. You're going to tell me what the fuck to do? I do not think so. I do not think so, motherfucker. We'll get that straight today. And then it ain't, like, ain't got to be no shit. And they move a nice old lady in next to me. And everybody knows how I feel about the elderly. I respect them, so I keep it down to a minimum. Got a new, new, uh, new guy from Pennsylvania moved in. Nice fellow. So, love thy neighbors, what Jesus said. So, I don't hold it in my heart. I actually kind of felt like I had done the wrong thing because I had the evil in my eye. And I think um, Luke chapter 11, uh, verse 33, speaks about the lamp in the eye, the light in the eye. It's like you keep the light in the eye when you look at people. You don't have irritation or frustration with them. You overcome that in your spirit and you look upon them with love it can be difficult sometimes like um, when somebody tells you to wear a mask when you're just trying to get a case of beer like you want to say something but what's the point you just I mean they're already suffering they already look miserable the only reason that they're attacking you is because they want to know like why you're not doing it and they have to it's because you don't stand up for yourself that's why because you ain't got no fucking balls that's why. And you're miserable. And I can see it on your face. And so I don't go into a place where a bunch of people are fucking miserable. And they inflict that misery on themselves. And they share that misery with others. Because somehow, I guess it makes them feel better about themselves, but it doesn't appear to. Yeah. 
All right. Chinese aggression. Don't think it's going to happen. Australia. I like the Australians. I think they'll. I think they'll get their shit together in a pretty quick way. South Africa. Um, let's talk about that a little bit because we've seen the jam up in the Suez Canal. I'm going to show you how easy that is. Now, say you got some kind of conflict in North Africa. Say you some got some other kind of shit that was shut down the Suez Canal. You talk about billions of dollars in global trade. Now, a while, a good long while ago, I did a, a whiteboard presentation. I'm thinking Hank's real life discussions. And it's called um, The Energies of Financial Engineering, in which I kind of um, equate. Uh, economic energy with engineering principles to make it under make it more easily understood and part of this COVID thing is like the shock testing that I was speaking about in that particular um, Hank's real life discussions where they'll shock test a system to see where the failure points are, the weak points, because if the world deglobalizes, and it will, and America pulls into a more neutral position, which I believe we will, and people have to fend for themselves, and the currencies either collapse or they go to individual nations, this can cause a little friction. So they just want to see, like, what happens if we do close the borders? What happens if we do lockdowns? What happens if we do freeze this, that, and the other? What businesses are essential? How damaged are we when we do away with these things? When are, like, how are we going to retool? To what purpose do we retool? Who can be retrained? Who will resist? What Will there be conflicts that will will break out? It's an economic shock testing. And just to, to fuck with people like that is um, to destroy their lives. It ain't right. It ain't right. But it doesn't mean that the powers that be won't do it because they, they are at a they're at a level. They are playing a different game where they're just on they're playing a different game and sometimes you, you gotta realize they don't give a fuck about you now some do some do I do but all I do everything I'm gonna have to do everything locally and that's what we should all really ultimately focus on but um, I have a little more faith in my countrymen than some other people do. Because um, I've talked to a few of them in my time. And I know we're not as dumb as we look. We're not all fat and dumbed down. Man, a good vast majority of any population is full of zombies. Anywhere in the world. Doesn't matter where. Which is a point that I can bring up when I speak to the, um, the, the potential hidden hand or the third actor in Eritrea, Ethiopia, Yemen, Saudi Arabia, and the methods of military genius. Well, a military genius will, will set it up in a way that no matter who wins, he wins. So what could the objective be? Could it be uranium? Could it be... Because the, the military genius is going to be thinking about the material. To the people that generally are whipped up to fight, are whipped up to fight on ideological grounds. They could be racial grounds, they could be uh, religious differences, they could be tri intertribal. So if you have an eight-front war in Ethiopia, the military mastermind there might not personally give a fuck who wins. 
They just want maybe some piece of material there. Which, given that it's um, Africa, there may be uranium out there, or there may be something else in Ethiopia that ain't just coffee beans. There could be something important out there, which is something I'm going to have to investigate a little more thoroughly, figure out why, where they're hiding it. So Africa is a big place. Like the Middle East is a big place. The old Ottoman Empire, the Caliphate is a for it, and like that's why they div you know divided the Sunni and the Shia because when the when when the Muslims uh, uh, agree on something, Europe trembles as well they should as well they should. Because, um, you know, like I say, for all the technological superiority that um, Westerners, we believe that we have, and we quibble and we fight with each other over dumb shit when we really actually all need to stand together, be a little bit more dedicated to peace than pissing down each other's backs, but that's just a failure in leadership. Because those people don't give a fuck about you. If they did, I don't think the situation would be so fucked up. But I guess, you know, you've, I've read Machiavelli, The Prince. I mean, I know how ruthless. It's better to be feared than loved. Probably, both, probably to be both is better. Feared and loved. I'll put some leadership stuff in a, in a playlist, too. We may get on to like the uh, greatest depression impact solutions um, later because we're doing well, quite a bit in geopolitics today. Now, the, I've, I've spoken about the instigation of a uh, civil war. I don't think that card would be played, but if they definitely wanted to keep the, mili the American military industrial complex crippled <laughs> and out of the business of the Germans and the Russians, because the Germans will have that pipeline. I don't think anything is going to stop them. And it was all about, like, who is going to take their taste in the Ukraine. And I would not want to be trapped between Russia and Germany when they want something. So, silver, you can take the silver or the lead, I think. You can take the silver or the lead. And if, you know, they try to trigger Article 5, I bet the Germans would see to the dissolution of NATO. I mean, where are the American military bases? Germany. Germany. So if that's what the Germans want, that's what the Germans are going to get. If that's what the Russians want, that's what the Russians are going to get. And... It's like even if America wanted to do something about it, what the fuck you gonna do? You know? How can you even get to the Ukraine? That'd be a real, especially if you don't have any, if you can't trust the Germans. And they're gonna try and undermine you. Or they're just gonna out and out say no. As NATO's dissolved, you're not gonna fly anything anywhere. So it would be best, I think, in my opinion, and I'm no expert in foreign policy, but I would say leave uh, well enough alone and stay the fuck out of it. And that way we can, ha you know, have good, good relationships with both the Germans and the Russians, because those, are, you know, you know, historically we've had good relationships with Russia, Russia. Um, and as for the Germans, it's just like the Japanese. We fought, we had it out, and that's a, a chapter in history I don't think any of us want to repeat. And we're uh, Christians. The Japanese are not Christian, but we had it out. And um, even to this day, I believe that we owe the Japanese a debt of honor.
but um, I'm big on that. Uh, let's see. I think I spoke a little bit about the emerging ideologies because you got the brainwashed people that they could probably uh, slap a swastika on their arm just so they don't have to, um, just so they don't have to like you know hear anything about how uh, you know they're not wearing a swastika so they can buy their groceries or whatever the fuck you know there's just that level of people that will bow down and lick boots just because they're just that fucking low I mean they're barely human in my opinion and um, I mean they'd suck a dick for a loaf of bread and that's um, no offense to anybody that sucks dick I guess <laughs> I guess that could be offensive. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> terrible. Friggin' terrible. I try to keep you entertained, at least. Okay. The, the Mexican aut autonomy, I think we talked about that already. You, you know, it's like, when we get these little surges of, um, of immigrants, of course they're com coming in the wintertime. So they don't... Uh, fucking die in the in the desert in um northern mexico it's like all desert then it gets to the mountain region and then you got a little farmland um till you get down towards um yucatan and then um what is it guatemala belize nicaragua uh, where you really get into the mountains, like mountainous stuff. Uh, so it's like even Mexico City sits on a big mountain. It's a huge city. It's pretty much where everybody in Mexico lives is Mexico City. It's massive. Um, so Mexican autonomy, I'm, I'm very serious about that. And I, and I don't think the Mexicans really like having their shit run by the cartels any, any more than anybody else does. I mean, who who likes to be under the rule of a fucking bunch of thieves, murderers, lacking principle, caring only about money, and they don't give a shit what it takes to get it? Like, I think in America, we've kind of got a sensation of what it's like to be around a bunch of uh, warmongering criminals. So Mexican autonomy is a very important thing. And I believe America can help Mexico if Mexico wants American help. Otherwise, leave them the hell alone. Because then that's, that's a conflict nobody really wants because then, um, you know, for the most part, Mexicans are Christian. Like, um, in my area, we don't have necessarily a lot of um, Mexicans, but we do have a lot of um, Islanders, like Puerto Rico, for example. It's a territory, so they're just as American as I am. I was at the pool the other day, and uh, um, there's a sp Spanish-speaking guy, even though, like, Puerto Rican is well, different than Spanish, but I guess, you'd, I, I guess you'd get the gist of it, right? I said, are you American? He said, no, I'm Puerto Rican. I said, Puerto Rican, you're just as American as I am. <laughs> he laughed. He's cooking ribs out there. Well, I was having shrimp cocktail right in AGRs. Taking a little nap in the sun. And we have, you know, I think we've, you know, we've got a few, you know, Cubans and stuff in Miami, but not quite. Well, I mean, I haven't been to Miami. <laughs> But um, yeah, see, but there's a culture there too, and I, I like I like that culture because it's family oriented, it's Christian oriented, um, you know, it's like my Ecuadorian friends and um, my Greek uh, friends and Russian friends, and I mean we all share one thing in common, and that's our uh, our Christianity, our faith, and uh, it's awesome, it's awesome. So, I guess we can explore um, South America a little bit more 
at a later time because I've, I've probably gone on long enough. I could read you a little bit um, from, let's say, like we right before Teddy Roosevelt was in office, um, I was actually going to speak about uh, what I had set this up initially to be an AGR called a Muckraker. And if you've ever read a book um, called Pilgrim's Progress by Bunyan, there is a, it's a great book, by the way, shows how difficult Christianity is. The, how following the Christian path is, is a difficult one. To start with the Bible is hard. I freely admit that. So some other books like um, The Imitation of Christ, uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Um, let me see, what else is a good good piece of Christian literature that helps you really kind of get a grasp. Well, I mean, there's also, too, some, some, some other things that, you know, pre-Christian ideas. But anyway, um, it's called Pilgrim, Pilgrim's Progress. In any way, there's a, a character that's the muckraker in it, and he's always looking down. And basically, Teddy Roosevelt talks about the muckrakers. The muckrakers were the with the uh, journalists so in that in that time period that stirred up a lot of shit and didn't really look up with any solutions. They just said you're talking a bunch of shit but you got no solutions, which is kind of the way I feel that we're in our current situation. We got a people that are a bunch of people that are complaining, but we're not hearing a lot of solutions. So, I have solutions for you, but I feel like I've talked my friggin' head off today. I feel like I've talked for at least an hour, maybe two hours at this point. It's been Hank, your Pajama Scholar. I'll catch you on the flip side. Leave a comment, you know, give me some direction as to what you'd like me to expand on so I'm not just drifting aimlessly in the vast conspiracy so monstrous that you can hardly believe it exists once you confront it. It's been Hank, your pajama scholar. Catch you on the flip side.